I'm gonna be uh, talking about the unexpected life with T1D. So, anyone knows what T1D refers to? I like asking questions, by the way. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask you a question. How many of you were not able to address a promise that they gave to themselves on daily basis? On, let's say, terms of two years, five years, 10 years, a promise you gave yourself. You gave a loved one, a fa family member, a loved one, a friend, a colleague. I did, many times. I did that for more than a couple of years as well. And then I learned a lesson. Today I'm gonna to be sharing a story of a child. So, as you can see, we have two twins. So those twins actually, and I'm not gonna be sharing the story of the two twins, I'm gonna be sharing the story of the other twin with, who's smiling on the right side. So you can see guys over there, because I think I'm standing over there, blocking the screen. So that child was actually the cheerful one, was living a regular life like everyone else. Happy, cheerful, smiley, eat any kind of food that anyone would eat at that age. After six months, he was frail, he was thin. He went to the hospital, or he went to the toilet often, and he drank water on a regular basis, more than we are supposed to drink as normal, healthy people. So, one day, he peed on the carpet. And the housekeeper noticed that aunts are gathering on that urination area. And his parents took him to the hospital. And when they took him to the hospital, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. That wasn't easy for a child living with diabetes for when he was two years old, and it wasn't easy for his parents. So they took him abroad, they took him to London, just to have another diagnosis that there can be a treatment for type 1 diabetes, that we didn't do anything wrong. But actually type 1 doesn't happen because you did something wrong. Your body fights your beta cells, so it stopped producing insulin. And everything changed in that instant. Food has changed, four to six injections per day. He had to check his blood sugar through urination or pricking his fingers just to get the results of, of managing the condition. And at that time, it was just for survival. When he was diagnosed in 1985, it just survived the next day. There wasn't that flexibility in medication that will help you to live a healthy and a productive life with diabetes. When he was five years old, he had an amazing doctor. She had empathy and understanding and a motherly bonding correlation with him and his parents. So they grew to be caring about each other, understanding each other, and knowing that living with diabetes can be managed and can be tackled by taking into consideration certain aspects and certain considerations into mind. When he was 13, his doctor decided to go back to Cairo because he was actually, her husband was not doing very well with his health and she needed to aid him. So she went to Cairo and she asked him for a promise. So when she asked him for a promise in that farewell dinner, he's the one sitting on her, on the left side of the screen, right side of the screen, and she asked him for a promise. Can you promise me to take good care of your health? And she, he said, yes, yeah, I can do that. But he never understood the depth of a promise. When you give a promise, you give hope to yourself and to others. So when you give a promise at work or to your friends or your family members, you're giving them hope. When you don't deliver that promise, you shatter their world. So be careful of a promise, the power of a promise. When he was starting to grow older, he went to adult doctors who are treating diabetes and he lost the bonding, he lost the empathy, the understanding of diabetes and the understanding of the the psychological aspect of it, because diabetes is 70% psychological and 30% is medication and nutrition. So he started to go in the early stages of depression, 
He thought he was alone. He, th he thought he was isolated. Although he had very much understanding parents, understanding family members. But he never understood that he was cared about because he's going through his cocoon. He was going through the deep levels and abyss of depression because of not understanding what is diabetes, what it's causing him in the mental aspect of it. He graduated from university. He got a professional degree in insurance. And when he reached 28, he got married. Then he got a divorce. Then he went into severe diabetes coma. And in that coma, he saw a galaxy. And when he saw the galaxy, he saw beautiful stars in yellow, pink, and blue. And I heard a voice in his head saying, that it's not your time yet to die. You have things to do. When he woke up in the hospital, his father was standing on the right side of the bed. His father was a senior in his mid-70s. And he was freaked out. So he asked himself, what kind of an adult am I? I'm 28 years old, I should be ailing my parents, and I'm becoming a burden. Why shouldn't I manage my diabetes the proper way? But he still didn't understand the meaning of managing diabetes, understanding what is diabetes, how it can be managed. Is it psychological, or is it just medication? So at the end of 2011, the same year he was married and got a divorce and got a coma, he won a draw. That draw was a motorcycle, and it was sold to a guy working in the Smart Diabetes Institute. So when he was taking the papers to that guy working in the Smart Diabetes Institute, he asked, can I have a tour? He said, yeah, definitely you can have a tour. He said, can I see the facilities and the facilities in this place? And he said, yes. So when he was passing through the clinics, he saw a name of a doctor that rang a bell. A doctor, he never heard her name for more than 16 years. And when he came in, she was standing in her office. The door was on my left side. And she was standing there, wearing black, with a beautiful scarf. And it was rainy at that day. It was late February. And there was silver lining in the sky. And there is a ray of light coming in, beaming on her. And when he saw her, he said, Dr. Azza, and she looked at him and she said, where have you been? I've been looking for you. I've been looking for you. And he hugged her and he shed the tear. And she hugged him. And so what happened to you? He said, I went through this hardship and so on. And she said only one sentence that he needed to hear at that instant moment. That everything is going to be okay. That's all he needed to hear. At the end of March, he was enrolled to Daphne course, dose adjustment for normal eating. He met other individuals living with diabetes, not just him, doing very well with their condition, taking good care of their health. Some of them are athletes, some of them are doing their PhDs. And he said, if they can do it, I can do it. And it took him four years and a half to reach the required levels of the required range of diabetes. He had six to seven hypos per day, hypo mean low blood sugar. So you can imagine if you didn't go to the gym for three years and go to the gym after that, what, what does your muscle feel like? It's aching, it's, it's painful, it's painful to move from bed. That the same thing happens with a hypo. But your body starts to shut down. In the long term, you're gonna have memory loss. And that memory loss will have insomnia. So, it took him four years and a half of sleepless nights of many repetitive change in car carbs counting, change of ratio, and so on. And he said, I cannot, I cannot change my body. I cannot change, rep I can replace a car, I can replace my phone, I can replace my laptop, but I cannot replace my body. I don't want my body to shut down. I don't want to be a liability towards others. I have to take care of my health. But in four years that he was managing his diabetes, he was also helping others, living with the condition that he didn't want them to go through depression. He worked in many organizations in Kuwait and abroad. He became a spokesperson to protect the rights of people living with diabetes. He also worked with people living with disability, as well as working in countries with low income to build clinics and hospitals for 
poor villages who lack education and lack healthcare services. At that time, he understood the meaning of a promise towards himself and a promise towards loved ones when he gave out a promise to take good care of himself. He understood that the agreements he had in his life wasn't right, that he didn't love himself in the beginning to come out and say, I have diabetes, I'm fine with my condition. That diabetes was a weakness point he considered in his mindset, but it was actually the strength point because he met a lot of interesting people abroad. That politics and religion didn't make any kind of an issue or tackle an issue because diabetes was the cause of protecting others to have insulin access, to fight discrimination, as well as being compassionate, have an empathy, that we're human beings, what makes us human beings is empathy, is caring, is sharing. We're not actually born with hate, we're born with love. And he met a lot of interesting people in his life while he's growing that taught him love and understanding and appreciation, that his parents did care about him and they did care that they lo loved him, but the depression fogged his sight, not to see things clearly. That I'm not the only one diagnosed with diabetes, I can, I'm gonna die. No, 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 you have to take a stand. Don't act as, as a victim. If you have diabetes, or you have a chronic condition, that means you're, you're meant to do something good. You're meant to, to have the compassionate aspect in you, to understand others, not to be judgmental, but to be humble. That's what he learned from diabetes. So I'm gonna ask you for one final exercise. I need you all to stand up, please. Everyone, this is an exercise for you guys. I need you to raise your right hand and put it on top of your left chest, on the top of your heart. Close your eyes and give yourself a promise. A promise towards yourself or someone you love, your wife, your husband, your kids, your partner, friends, colleagues, think about it, even yourself. And once you give that promise, you can have a seat. Thank you. So, the revelation. In their farewell dinner, he had with his doctor and his amazing family, and his twin, who was also diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was seven, and they never spoke about it because it was the depression that's going on. She asked him for a one final promise that you protect the rights of my children who are living with diabetes against discrimination for insulin access, as well not to be punished or to be violated at home because they're not managing their diabetes properly. And he gave that promise. He gave them that promise that I will do that. And he's working on the law since 2017 and now it's being drafted by the law firm. I am the child who was diagnosed with type one diabetes. I was the teenager who rebelled on himself and diabetes and screwed up things. And I am the one who understood what diabetes means that is giving, that is caring, that what gives you hope, that hope is a candle you give to others. When you give it to others, you give it to yourself. You light the fire in you to help others and help yourself and understand that world is actually, is love and care. My name is Mohammed Al-Bahar. I'm living an unexpected life with diabetes. Thank you.